possible in cell culture. This is essentially a summary of the project as it was originally conceived and as it still is conceived. First of all, we figure out how to isolate strains of bacteria that have the appropriate effect on whatever target substance we're looking at. And as I've already emphasized, there's an awful lot of different target substances that we might want to um, actually affect because neurodegeneration, atherosclerosis, also macular degeneration, which we've been working on too. These are all diseases for which this is a massively important process. So we've got a, um, a lot of this to do. We've got to get pretty good at identifying the enzymes that are allowing the bacteria to do these things. And as I've shown you, we're already doing that. We're just at this stage three at the moment um, for one or two of these um, target compounds to make transgenic versions of cells that will be able to express these things, or alternatively, just to make um, modifications of the proteins themselves so that they just go into the right part of the cell so that they can, have the, they can help to degrade these substances. After that, though, there's a lot more to do. We've got to get those things working in such a way that they're not toxic, they don't break down things that we would like to leave alone. That turns out, well, there are lots of tricks that we can use for that, but it's got to be done. And then, of course, we've got to move on to doing the same thing in live animals, in mice, in the laboratory. It's only after we get all of that working really well that we're going to be in a position to move on to clinical trials. So, you know, it's a long project, an ambitious project, and a fairly expensive project, for sure. But the fact is that when this works, and we can now say with pretty damn good confidence that it will work one day, when this works, it's going to be absolutely out of sight. It's going to be vastly more effective against this large number of extraordinarily prevalent and otherwise untreatable diseases than anything we have now. You know what we've got now for atherosclerosis? Obviously, we can do almost nothing. We can delay it a little bit using statins or at a later stage, you know, putting stents in and so on. It's really, you know, pathetically inadequate, as all of the medics in the audience must appreciate. And there's nothing, and there's nothing appreciably better coming down the pike either. So we really need to aim high and develop things that are still a long way off in order to have any chance of eventually consigning these terrible diseases to history. And that's what I would like to do. Um, now I'm going to go, no, actually, not, well, okay, yeah, so here, I'll, I'll mention this now because I can. Um, this is a book that I um, wrote a couple of years ago together with one of my research assistants, Michael Ray. Um, and it's written for the non-specialist. In other words, it minimizes technical jargon. But the biologists who read it will not be disappointed in terms of the amount of detail. It doesn't cut any corners either. So this is definitely something that I recommend to you all. Now I'd like to go back to the beginning of my presentation, if I can, and give the rest of the talk. This is the foundation that I'm the chief science officer of, and that John Schwendon, who I mentioned earlier, works for, and there are a couple of other people here. Um, Kevin Perrett, who's just walked out of the room, is one of our directors. Um, so it's um, the foundation that is orchestrating a lot of this work. We're a US-registered charity. Uh, we're interested in a wide range of different approaches, but there is one common theme that we're interested in, and it's something that John Ferber mentioned earlier, which is we're interested in reversing aspects of aging. That's what our focus is, as opposed to areas that involve slowing aging down. We very much support work that slows aging down, but we feel that the biggest difference can be made, that we can get the biggest bang for the buck by developing ways to actually turn the clock backwards in various ways. All right, so um, of course we're interested in doing this uh, in, in the global community as well. So we do a lot of education and outreach work. And we also have an in-house laboratory I mentioned earlier that is headed by John. And we, we also spend a bunch of our money on extramural support of work in laboratories. Um, so the reason we focus on this is because of the way that we look at the concept of aging. This is how I like to define aging. It's a process of the ongoing, lifelong accumulation of various types of molecular and cellular damage that eventually, when they become abundant enough by late in life, eventually cause metabolism to work less well and they cause the various aspects of age-related ill health. That leads us to Traditionally, this has led people to two different approaches to combating aging, one of them being to essentially stop damage from having this eventual pathogenic effect, or to slow it down. Uh, and that's what I'm calling the geriatrics approach, focusing on old people. Um, and of course, that's you know, better than nothing. And then the other approach, which I'm going to call the gerontology approach, which says, well, let's be more preventative about this. Let's try and clean up metabolism so that the rate at which it throughout life cre creates these various types of damage is slower. Um, 
Of course, there's a problem with the geriatrics approach, which is aging is so damn complicated, um, and it's really intervening just too late in the game. It's just there's too many things going on, exacerbating each other, it's a downward spiral. So the geriatrics approach is better than nothing, but not much better, and realistically, it never will be much better than nothing. Unfortunately, the gerontology approach is also beset by a massive problem, which is that we understand so little about how our own biology works. This is a simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about how cells work. Um, but actually, the real problem is that this is a simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about how cells work, which is completely dwarfed by the enormous amount that we don't know. Um, so I realized some time ago in this hotel that we might be able to adopt a repair and maintenance approach to combating aging. In simple man-made machines like cars, we know that this can work. Here is a car that's lived unusually long just because it was built well. Okay, but here is a car that's lived the same amount of time. This car was also built in the early 1950s, um, simply by being well maintained. This car was not designed to live more than 10 or 15 years, but it's lived more than 50. So it shows us that maintenance works for simple machines. The human body is a machine too. It's a really complicated one, but it's still a machine. So why shouldn't maintenance work there as well? In other words, why shouldn't we do this? This is what the maintenance approach is, going back to my original diagram. Rather than trying to disrupt this process whereby metabolism causes damage, or this process whereby damage eventually causes pathology, we go in and periodically repair the damage so that it never reaches the level of abundance that is pathogenic. Um, that's one good thing about the maintenance approach. Another really good thing is that it's fairly simple. Um, this morning, Don Ferber gave a brief list of the sorts of ways that he likes to break down the concept of uh, the, the problems of aging into various components. This is the breakdown that I'd like to give. It's pretty much the same. Um, various things that happen. I've spoken just now about the accumulation of junk inside cells. I spoke earlier about the accumulation of mitochondrial mutations. I think that these seven different categories are all we need to worry about. There's only seven different types of damage that happen during life and that eventually ha we have some reason to believe contribute to age-related pathology. One reason I think that we can say that is because it's been the same list for more than a quarter of a century. Another way is we can just look at our biology and we can say, okay, what are the long-lived structures in the body that, um, no, for which there is uh, the possibility to accumulate damage? And we can just come up with that more or less the same list. And these are the approaches that I think we can take to fixing those things. We've heard a lot about all of these things today now. I've spoken about mitochondrial mutations and how to fix them. I've spoken about this approach to getting rid of junk inside cells. Um, we've heard from Mike West, of course, about cell therapy for um, replacing cells that are lost because, they're not, because they die and they're not automatically replaced. Um, we've heard a little bit about um, cross-linking from John Ferber with uh, molecules that break these things called advanced glycation end products. Um, some things that we haven't heard so much about today yet, um, but that are also important, is getting rid of cells that are um, accumulating, not because they're proliferating too much, but because they're just not dying when they should. And the phoresis mechanism uh, for getting rid of what I think someone called lazy immune cells is a fine example of what we need to do here, but we're um, interested in other approaches as well. There's an approach to getting rid of garbage in the spaces between cells that involves immunization, and we also heard a little bit about that earlier on today, um, especially from Steve Coles, because this thing called TTR amyloidosis is an example of extracellular junk. Um, and uh, finally, there's this question about mutations in the nucleus. Now, I have the um, somewhat unpopular belief that if we can deal with cancer really well, then, which, I, which I propose to do by a rather elaborate approach that I don't have time to talk about today, um, then we will be done. That mutations not relevant to cancer and not relevant to any of these other problems up here simply don't accumulate fast enough during, during life so to, to actually contribute to aging in anything like a currently normal lifetime. And here I'm also talking about epimutations, which means changes not to the sequence, but to the um, decorations of the sequence that determine which genes are turned on and off in a particular cell type. Um, we'll be hearing from Robert Bradbury not, in not, not too long about a uh, an alternative view, I think. I don't think he agrees with me on this point. Um, but this is what I think. I um, reckon it's basically a, a, a good side effect of cancer. It's because we have to defend so well against cancer that we also defend unnecessarily well against other mutations. And I think that's also something that protects us from another problem, which is glycation end products that are not cross-links. I think they only accumulate 
um, as slowly as they do because we have to protect against the creation of crosslinks. So, yeah, this is a pretty interesting and optimistic list. Um, it makes me feel pretty good about the possibility that we will be able to combat aging really successfully, really comprehensively with the regenerative approach and get this sort of extension of lifespan, uh, 30 years at least, um, within the next few decades. Um, these are the things that are discussed in the book that I mentioned earlier that came out a couple of years ago, and the book is still reasonably up to date. But of course, stuff happens all the time. So the paperback edition, which came out a year later, has an entire new chapter summarizing all the advances that happened in only those 12 months. So yeah, that's, that's pretty good news. And that's where I'd like to stop. Thank you very much. So questions for section two.